If it had done nothing more, New York City would have remained forever after the greatest port on the Atlantic seaboard. But a larger destiny lay in store, and to achieve it, two immense obstacles would have to be overcome. One was the geography of Manhattan Island, whose rugged natural landscape was a hindrance to orderly growth. The other was the geography of the American continent, to whose vast interior riches the city's merchants still had no easy access. The man who would attempt to solve both problems, and in so doing, stake a claim to being the greatest New Yorker of all time, was a six foot three inch patrician politician, so brilliant and commanding, that friends and enemies alike called him Magnus Apollo. In 10 terms as mayor of the city and three as governor of the state, DeWitt Clinton would do more to shape the future of New York than anyone else in its history. To do that, he would first have to bring order out of chaos, then reach westward and transform geography itself. DeWitt Clinton is arguably the most important person who ever lived in New York, and I understand that this is an environment that included Peter Stuyvesant and Robert Moses and Franklin D. Roosevelt and Fiorello LaGuardia. Uh, but DeWitt Clinton was there at the critical moment in New York City's history when it was not clear that it would be the dominant city that it later became. DeWitt Clinton had a vision of New York that was not to be the official capital of the United States, and he understood its bases to be the economy and culture. And it was to those two things that he devoted himself with extraordinary focus. An admirer of Alexander Hamilton and heir to Hamilton's glorious commercial vision of New York, Clinton would finish laying the foundation of the modern city. In 1807, to help bring order to the chaos of the city's rapid northward growth, he oversaw the creation of a special commission to come up with what he hoped would be a final and conclusive plan for the development of Manhattan Island. There lay before the city fathers a vast island, another 10 miles of it roughly, running north-south. How would they organize it? Commissioners organized it in a very American way, very Jeffersonian way, on a grid. In 1811, the commissioners unveiled their plan. On a giant map, more than eight feet long, they had projected an astonishing vision of the future that would shape the destiny of Manhattan for centuries to come. The grid is the most courageous act of prediction in Western civilization. The land it divides, unoccupied. The population it describes, conjectural the buildings it locates, phantoms. Rem Koolhaas. At a time when New York City was still huddled at the southern tip of Manhattan, Clinton's commissioners proposed leveling the entire natural geography of the island and replacing it with a single massive grid, 12 avenues wide and 155 streets long, covering 11,000 acres with more than 2,000 blocks. There had been grid plans before, but never on this scale. At a time when the city held fewer than 100,000 people, the plan envisioned a giant metropolis of more than a million. If realized, it would transform Manhattan into the most populous city on Earth. It was an extraordinary thing to impose geometry on an island. It was an enchanting island. It was uh, all covered with oak and hemlock and fir, and there were lots of ponds and streams and springs, and it was all up and down hill. And instead of allowing for the ups and downs and saving the books and streams and everything, this grid iron, this really cruel grid iron, torturous method, uh, was, was laid down over the whole island. In the pre-grid days, we respected nature, partly because we couldn't do much about it. So roads go around hills, they circumvent ponds, no more. Now, hills were to be leveled and thrown into ponds. 
land was to be filled in. This was to become one of the most man-made artificial spaces in the history of the planet. Inscribed within the grid was an extraordinary vision of what New Yorkers wanted their city to be. One imperial, there's a sense of expansion northward, the numbers run up. Two, democratic, because the streets are gonna be numbered, they're not gonna be named. Three, efficient, it makes it easy for immigrants, people who don't speak English, to navigate their way around to their workplace and to selling places. Four, a sense of routinizing and regularizing the real estate market because everything is gridded up in advance so that you can buy and sell plots easily with great convenience. Perhaps the most extraordinary is the conviction that you are going to totally triumph over nature. And the notion that you can in fact shape, reshape, reformulate things is again right near the bone of the New York idea. With its thousands of blocks, each more or less identical to every other, the grid envisioned a remarkably uniform and democratic city. And with its hundreds of streets leading down to the rivers, a relentlessly commercial one. The almost complete absence of park space in the commissioner's plan would haunt the city for decades to come. And you know, the grid is often attacked. People say that it's capitalist speculation or that it's an unlovely form, you know. They say that it's, uh, it's monotonous, it's totalitarian. I don't think anybody who's ever been in the New York grid, if he's honest with himself, experiences it as totalitarian. Too much is happening, it's too interesting. Um, so this is a kind of intellectual idea, a judgment that is overlaid onto it after the fact. So what you have in the grid is a, a powerful underorder in a city where there is so much anarchy. And you can stand on any cross street and you can see the river on either side. And also the breeze comes through and you get the sun rising on one side and the sun setting on the other side. It's also quite nice, the big, long, straight avenues that run north-south, which John Paul Sartre admired. He loved these big, straight avenues in which you could see the light always. And they seem somehow, in a way, a representation of American limitlessness, geographic limitlessness. It's hard to imagine, unless you really set your mind to it, that it was ever anything else. It's almost as if Manhattan had been a city since antiquity, that somehow the Indian tribes that lived here had put down pavement. That great plan indicated to people who had no intention of stopping. They're going to go right up to the top of uh, the island, to the Harlem River, and uh, go on from there. It was part of an optimism uh, that was real, and it was an optimism that was self-fulfilling. Uh, you lay out a street plan like that, and the next thing you know, someone bought a corner lot. And um, the transportation followed it. Uh, it wasn't long before you had uh, horse-drawn uh, trolleys. The commissioner's plan of 1811 was one of the most far-sighted urban visions ever conceived. And yet its audacity was nothing compared to that of another proposal DeWitt Clinton put forward that same year. Not an eight-foot map, but a 363-mile-long ditch that, if completed, would transform forever New York's relation to the entire American continent. When you think of the United States in 1800, it's really a country that's huddled along the East Coast. Movement to the interior of the North American continent is blocked by what we no longer think is the substantial mountain chains, the Appalachians, the Alleghenies. But from the perspective of 1800, they were impressive indeed. There were no blasted highways through there. There were no railroads through there. There were no rivers that took you easily through there. You had to walk up those mountains and walk down them and then up another one and down. So they were a formidable barrier. And what we had to do, both in New York and in the nation, is to figure out a way to get inside the continent. For years, New York merchants had been dreaming of the immense wealth locked in the continent's interior. In 1811, DeWitt Clinton came up with a way of getting at it. If nature had provided them no river to the west, New Yorkers would simply have to build one. 
When one looks at a map of the United States and one looks at the Mississippi River, one cannot but assume that the greatest city in the New World is going to be where New Orleans is, that here's one of the greatest river systems in the world. But it didn't happen that way. And it didn't happen that way because New Yorkers took the geographical advantage they had and got access to that uh, agricultural hinterland that seemed to belong to New Orleans. The only gap in the chain of mountains running from New Hampshire to Georgia is providentially located in New York State. And Governor DeWitt Clinton had enough sense to see that this was a very valuable asset and to build the Erie Canal over the collective dead bodies of most of the politicians from New York City who did not see that connecting the Middle West to the Hudson and New York City would turn into a cash cow. The scope of the project was nothing less than mind-boggling, an artificial waterway, unlike anything undertaken since the days of the ancient Egyptians. At a time when the longest canal in America ran just 27 miles, and most less than two, Clinton's canal would have to run more than 350 miles across the rugged wilderness of upstate New York. Thomas Jefferson himself rejected the scheme outright, calling it little short of madness. So did the New York State Legislature and President James Madison, who warned that its $5 million cost would bankrupt the federal government. But DeWitt Clinton would not be deterred. The Great Erie Canal, he declared, would make New York one of the most splendid commercial cities on the face of the earth. Appealing directly to the public, he lobbied tirelessly for what his detractors called Clinton's Big Ditch, holding mass rallies in New York City and circulating a petition eventually signed by more than 100,000 New Yorkers. Clinton himself devised an ingenious scheme to pay for it all, using public funds to attract private investors and showing once and for all how great public works could be built in a democracy. How did Clinton build the Erie Canal? By promising bankers he would make money if they lent him the funds to do so. Uh, and no ideology about it. Jefferson wouldn't dream of having the national government involving itself in an affair of this kind for doctrinal reasons. The, the Jeffersonians were against internal improvements. Uh, Hamilton was all for them, and uh, boy, did they make money. In 1817, the state of New York, encouraged by uh, Governor DeWitt Clinton, issued what at the time was a staggering indebtedness, or issuing its bonds, to build this waterway across upstate New York, connecting essentially the Hudson River at Albany with the Great Lakes at Buffalo. That ditch, that 363-mile ditch, uh, only a couple dozen feet wide, was the most important public works project in American history until the Interstate Highway Program was passed in 1956. The canal was dug with Irishman mules and Monongahela whiskey in about seven years. A massive feat, and, and you cross the canal now, still there, uh, now clean, because Lake Erie is clean, and uh, you go along, about every 15 miles you come to a town, where something extraordinary in manufacturing commercial history began. It was one of the few public works projects in New York that didn't have a cost overrun, was finished on schedule. In fact, it paid for itself by being partially open before it was fully completed. On October 26th, 1825, three full years ahead of schedule, the mammoth undertaking was complete. The Great Erie Canal, one observer said, has defied nature and used it like a toy. With 83 locks and 18 aqueducts, including an 800-foot water bridge over the Genesee River, it was the greatest engineering feat of its day. It had also worked nothing less than an economic miracle. It had once cost more to ship a ton of goods 30 miles inland than all the way to England. 
and taken more than three weeks to move a ton of wheat from Buffalo to New York. Now, it took just seven days, and the cost had been cut from $100 to less than six. At the opening celebrations, DeWitt Clinton, the undisputed hero of the day, poured a keg of water drawn from Lake Erie into New York Harbor. The symbolism was lost on no one. All America now met.